Good evening, everybody. It's my honor this evening to welcome you all and thank you ever so much for being here. It feels like a lifelong journey all in one room tonight, celebrating students coming through the Welsh School of Architecture, those architects here tonight who are in practice and who have kindly given us all the opportunity to be really, really nosy at their work. Thank you very much. Um, and for those to remember the recently passed and that have left a legacy behind. So I hope, firstly, that the students have managed to network with their potential future employers. That's one of the reasons that we put this initiative together was so that students and practice could meet. Um, and I hope that those 13 practices exhibiting have found value in this incredible exhibition. So I'm honoured now to be able to introduce you to this evening's memorial reception on behalf of David Lee. This evening, we're joined by many of David's loved ones, his family and friends and colleagues who are going to give, um, share their stories and works of David throughout his life and career. So Juliet, it's over to you to introduce everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eleanor, for that, um, and generally to RSAW for putting together this fantastic show and for really leading in the organization of the event um, this evening. We really couldn't have done without you in any aspect of it. Um, and I just want to welcome you all to the school, uh, whether you're students who generally seem to be gathered up there, um, whether you're uh, members of staff in the School of Architecture, whether you're practitioners who have your work exhibited here, or whether you're members of David's family um, or his friends. It's really great to, to have you in the school this evening and to welcome you to this event. Uh, we have three speakers this evening, um, all of whom are connected to David and his life and his work. Um, we have John Sargent, who is an Emeritus Fellow of Robinson College, Cambridge, and who was uh, one of my lecturers when I was a student many moons ago. Um, he's an expert on the history and theory of the modern movement um, and has lots of other interests besides. Uh, Benedict Fu, who I've also known for a very long time and it's who it's fantastic to see again this evening, who's an architect and a lecturer at Cambridge, um, also in Cambridge, the Department of Architecture, um, and who's known David and worked with David um, for, for a long time, and also with Pat Bora. And Pat Bora himself, um, as our third speaker, who is an architect, an expert in designing and building green buildings, um, closely involved with CAT from its earliest days, um, and who collaborated with David on the fantastic Wales Institute for Sustainable Building and many other projects besides. So without further ado, um, I invite the first speaker, who I believe is John, to, to come up. Should I press my button? No, oh, we want the first page. We don't want that. We'll be back on it. There we are. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. I, I, I feel it's a real honor to be here. Um, I've known North Wales all my life, but I, I didn't know South Wales at all. And I've just got back from a wonderful place called Wool Tack Point. I don't see any, anyway, you look, you look beyond and there's an island um, called Croisor or something. It's, a, it's got a, a, a Viking name. And beyond that is Canada. I mean, there's no, nothing, it's the end. And there were seals and dolphins, quite extraordinary. Anyway, so now I feel I know the rest of Wales. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are people who could have given this talk better than me. There's Peter Bundle Jones, who wrote and championed, who wrote about and championed David's work. But he sadly he's no longer with us. And then, of course, there's Adam Volker, who, who wrote the brilliant book, and he can't be here tonight either. So I'm a kind of stand-in. But I do have a, a claim uh, to some sort of priority because I've known him all my life, really. Uh, we met in our first day in studio 
in 1958, eyeing each other as the very competitive environment. Um, and uh, we've known each other ever since. So it was 1958 and we were, well, he was 19, I was 18. Um, he was quite a medieval uh, at, at Cambridge. I can't make this thing change. Oh, there's a vital button. No, it's not changing. Let me try. Go forward. You can't make it go either. <laughs> There we, there we go. go. Oh, so okay. you're going to have to do it. Yeah. Um, it was the, it, those brutalist days, and we were all made to make uh, flat buildings like Maison Jarreau out of brick and concrete, you may remember. Um, and David was, uh, he was really interested in, in medieval high-pitched roofs, 60-degree roofs he used to have. And then he found this wonderful project. This is, can you believe it, 1960. And it's the Danish Holiday House by Eric Korshagen in those brutalist days. You know, it's so minimal. You have to go outside to go into any space. And the quality of going outside was extraordinarily like Japanese Engawa next, which you see there. So I think in a way, in a subliminal sort of way, that David had a feeling for where he was going, even at that stage. Uh, thatch and at, at least 60, probably 70 degrees. And um, and this very, very beautifully realized uh, building just out of local materials. It's not minimalist in the sense of a style, it's because of natural materials and being close to nature and the place you're in. He was uh, into drumming in his first year, I remember. And uh, also judo, he frequently attacked me. <laughs> Next. I, had a, I was introduced to someone called Robin Silver, who had bought this boat called Messenger 2. And uh, he wanted to sell her to America, who he thought would buy an antique boat. He was, in, he was completely deluded. Anyway, he had to say that the problem needed a crew. <laughs> this thing isn't really working. Oh, she's going to make me louder. My voice is going to break. Um, and uh, are we there? Ah, oh, very good. Thank you. Um, so I volunteered and uh, looked around for someone else. David needed very little persuasion to join the crew. And uh, so we sailed the thing across the Atlantic. We took three days longer than Columbus. The solo sailors of those days were not particularly heroic. The real problem is not keeping awake and all of those things. Those are bad. But the problem is other people and politics on board. And we met quite a lot of uh, crew from other boats who had kind of deserted ship were looking for another boat next. And um, those feelings that were obviously you know, quite tense on some boats um, we enacted out, we enacted one day. I don't know whether we had ide ideas of pirates, but um, the miserable human being who you see before me was once the person on the left. And the person on the right is David, who started growing that beard. I found in my diary, I hadn't seen this for 60 years, but I found I found this entry. December the 18th, 1963, messenger two. At sea, three weeks and four days out. Fine, relaxed, rolling days, pushing west under the twin foresails. Light airs, force one, blue sky and tufty clouds, bubbling along at 60 to 80 sea miles a day. Or a fresh gray, force five to six, everything drum tight. 100 plus miles. Then in one evening, just like that, there was a sharp crack from up forward. And our star boom, our starboard boom had, had cracked, had snapped, and all the steering lines went crazy. <clears throat> In an incredible chaos, both twins were lowered, boom stowed, and lashed down, and now in violent pitching, and seas right over the bows, the staysail was hoisted. Under it and the mizzen, we stayed hove to for the night. The next day, the 19th, we were back to fore and aft rig, 
and watch keeping. David and I started mending the starboard twin boom, an accurate scarf joint in constant rolling and pitching is no easy matter. Anyhow, it was finished in two days, complete with gluing, bolting, and wire lashing, and quite a good joint, unquote. I have a question, hands up, who knows what a scarf joint is? Uh, now the same question for students. How many of you know what a scarf joint is? No hands going up. Well, David was a brilliant carpenter. Uh, I, I think actually in the future that's in front of us, you might need to know what a scarf joint is. Anyway, if you don't know how to make carpentry, it's very difficult to actually design detail. And I gather now there are even professional practices who do detailing. So, you know, we no longer do the money. We no longer do the calculations. And apparently we no longer do the detail. So what on earth do we do? Um, it's extremely worrying. Anyway, I commend carpentry. Next. So David joined uh, the London Borough of Merton in South London. Um, the borough architects department together with our friends uh, from Cambridge, Richard McCormack and Peter Bell. And they achieved, uh, an, uh, they used this perimeter theory. We, you've, you've probably, you've, you've taught by Cambridge people here, so you must know, all know about perimeter theory. Uh, anyway, you can get the same density by building low around the outside of the site as you can with a high building in the middle, given rules of overshadowing and so forth and car parking. Um, and they applied these theoretical ideas to this site for public housing, social housing in Merton. And they achieved the density of 250 people to the hectare with 80% of the site as open space with car courts, guard, everyone had a garden and a playing field. And they persuaded the borough to move an intended park to the site. So an extraordinary um, achievement, next. Then David became very interested in Walter Siegel. Uh, does Walter Siegel ring bells with today's students? Yeah, some nods, very good. So Walter shot the profession by building his studio and his garden in Hampstead for 1,200 pounds. And the, 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 the structure sat on a paving slab with a bit of concrete dug underneath. And um, he used uncut materials, pl uh, the plasterboard on the inside, glacial race skin on the outside, and wood wool panels. So that gave you a 600 mil tartan grid. And it meant that the, the power points and switches could only be on the vertical color buttons. Uh, do we have a detail? Yes, so you'd only have either structure here or you have your, your electrics. Next. So he used that system for uh, a sheltered housing project in church in, in, the, in Surrey, which I went to see many times. The brief was to make homes for widows who, who'd been working away from Britain. And uh, David's aunt was the client and uh, he had visited uh, Utzon's <clears throat> Similar project at Friedensburg, which you see down below. And uh, so they're little houses and the, he used the Siegel system, but increasingly started to suppress the structure because it looks like a packing case, uh, the Siegel one. Um, so it gave a much more uh, horizontal feeling uh, and a, a very much more Japanese aesthetic. And you see what he was beginning to do. He was beginning to run the wood wall slabs horizontally rather than vertically. So he got away from the 600 module because that gave you a door, which was, you know, just a little bit too narrow. Next. <clears throat> Small houses threaded together to make a larger hole. Gardening was a common interest of the ladies and was celebrated by David. He made a long visit to Japan in 1975. Actually, you don't know, but his father just uh, rang me up saying, what's happened to David after six months? He was very agitated. Yes. So David didn't communicate and 
it was, um, you know, steam mail in those days. The project developed, can we have the next, from Siegel's basic shelter into more and more of a reflection on traditional Japanese architecture. So the uh, finish in the last phase was, was actually rendered. So it, become, it became very much more like a Japanese tea house, you know, which is often it's rendered with a um, clay finish. Next. Mutual friends bought a ruined mill in the foothills of the Dolomites. Palladio's Villa Barberini at Mazer, yes? Yes, they're nodding, good, was not far away. It became a touchstone for David. Not some, as, you know, as you might think, but it's classical composition. The section is the key and it's wonderful, but I'm not gonna show you that. But for the arcades, now the arcades are two stories high on each side. They look like one, but they're two stories high. And they held accommodation for farm workers. And uh, he was fascinated by the idea of these double arcades. And he used them for the Takeley houses, which you see there, for a client, Chris Bailey, who became bursar at Sorencester Agricultural College. And he used them for an entry for competition for um, Keyes College in Cambridge. Two contrasting urban proposals of the 20th century for a typical family. On the left, Frank Lloyd Wright's decentralized house in Broadacre City. And on the right, Corbusier's high density apartment in Ville Radieuse. Of course, that's, the, that's not Ville Radieuse, but the plan is of, without me in the way, um, but that is the plan of the Ville Radieuse family unit. Next. David had worked for Harry Weiss in Chicago after we sailed, and I was in San Francisco working for Skidmore's SOM and moonlighting with Chuck Moore. David joined me there, and we went together to two Wright Usonians in the Bay Area. So that, that, that was the first Wright building I ever saw. And then I wrote a book about it later. Years later, the first client, really important client, Herb Jacobs of the Jacobs House, came to visit me in my small holding at Phoenix Farm. And that's Herb Jacobs with a berry talking to me, and there's David looking at the pony. Uh, note the head and tail plan of the Usonian house. Each house was placed at the close to the northern boundary to maximize the area of the garden. And note also the quality of light and the messing. Is it focused sharp? It looks much sharper here than it is on screen. Next. <clears throat> David moved to North Wales in 1976 and found Ogeronwy in Clanfrotham in Snowdonia. It became his home and office and attracted students and architects to work from everywhere, and there are two of you who recognize each other. <clears throat> Next, these are the Coates Manor houses of 1986, and David had already done a lot of work for what was then called the Royal Agricultural College in Sorencester. They sold um, this site to help fund new buildings, and he was asked to design five houses for sale on this site. And for me, they're one of his very best projects. So it's the development of the Usonian plan, plus an upper floor for two bedrooms, tiled roofs and rough cast walls with recycled pitch pine for the veranda. And the remaining structural walls were all of solid Jurox aerated concrete block with no cavity. Um, this is nothing to do with birth control, but a Jurox block is so light, you could pick it up and hold it with two fingers like that. So what he was after was a, sing a single dry operation. You built this thing with these big blocks and you plastered them inside and rendered them out. And, uh, and then uh, pay tiles on the outside. And he borrowed, he borrowed my own Phoenix farm for the uh, entry. The houses were greatly liked by their owners and they're beautifully planned. But you probably, I hope you've got the plan. That's as much as I'm going to show you next. 
another major interest that he had was to build well. That meant, if possible, natural materials sourced locally, everything made to last. And he was attracted to monasteries for the way they articulated social order and the elements of the plan, and of course, for their stone. The Cistercians did this best, here, Senanc. Um, and the ascetic attitude appealed to him. Unfortunately, in the early days, it went to his diet. It was extremely ascetic. It was exactly almost impossible to eat. We shared a love for Le Tourne, um, which in common with Corbeau, which um, you should go and see. It's amazing. Next, going back four years, I'd like to comment on his public work. Now, Chris Bailey, the client for the houses at Takeley, became bursa at the Royal Agricultural College and became a patron. So 1980 to 81 was Bledisloe Court. And 89 to 90, Code Court, tight planning and powerful placemaking, cross-ventilated study bedrooms, access by staircases, rough cast render on brickwork with local Cotswold stone-tiled uh, stone roof. Next. Diminishing courses, good for 300 years, when they may have to be relayed with fresh pegs. Approved by the then Prince Charles. Any suggestion of being part of new urbanism or urbanist nostalgia was strongly rejected by David. Traditional materials have their own discipline. The second phase, though, saw David starting to try to break out of what he saw as a threat from revivalism. Next, this is a house he wanted to build himself, the project, timber framed, and uh, then he got a lot of Western red cedar for, for this house. And some of it was it became used on other projects, but there's still some there left, I know, in, in the, uh, the small, small stone barn. An exemplar for a two bedroom house in a wet, frequently dark climate. A tight plan with a high skylit center and low perimeter. Note the sense of habitation, fully realized life. There would be no comfy cushions or plates on a convenient rack with minimalism. Next. A compressed version of the Coates Usonian plans, beautifully tuned spatially, with minor modification and a handed plan. It could be a semi-D, but he never intended this. I'm a member of the analog generation and acutely conscious of addressing you, a digital generation. However, I commend the type of drawing you see on the right is a kind of self-questioning as you design, you speak to yourself and you write, you write it down and then it becomes a, a, a kind of source of, of, as you reiterate your design, you refer back to what those priorities were. Next. David also had the ability to suggest the atmosphere he loved. Open windows, fresh air, bird song heard from a fully realized place of quiet. Fundamental needs, as we all realized during lockdown. It's worth studying the cast dotted shadow technique because an unlikely pioneer of this was Corbeau. Next. There's only time to discuss one last project, the Wise Center for CAT, 2002 to 10, realized with Pat Bora. I shan't say much because I'm sure he will. David stayed with me in Barcelona in 1999 and went four times, not once, but four times to Mies van der Rohe's reconstructed German National Pavilion from the original 1929 International Ex Exhibition. He was deeply impressed and gave himself the challenge of using organic materials in a modern way. This meant the flat roof and horizontal aesthetic, which depend on modern high energy detailing. So no more 60 degree roofs. As built, the project is a four story complex, stepping back on a former slate quarry and waste heap. You, it summarizes the purpose of an institution which was alternative in 1973, but is now mainstream. 
surely it time it's time for a new a new name perhaps by the end of the evening we might all have a new name for center of alternative technology it is no longer alternative i thought i thought of uh, appropriate it will still keep the cat part but over to you i know i know oh very good <laughs> very good it was hemmed in by pre-existing buildings and entry is past one the cafe which you see the little tables running up so we've you've come in either from the original entry the cafes over there or you come in from outside and you enter this space and go up a half level and as you go up there's a dramatic su surprise of an open courtyard around which teaching rooms and the lecture room are placed a separate stair leads to the residential accommodation which is planned as a an l roughly and finally the route ends up in the top floor where the route terminates at a common room with an angled distant view you see it, it angles toward the view it's kind of gestural next it was hemmed, hemmed in by pre-existing buildings and uh, the long gallery led as i described up so you you had these different different views as you went so that on the arrival floor on the right which is down here on the left next and the courtyard on the next level and the drum which we'll come to next and then above uh, is the the residential accommodation next the courtyards oh no we, we've got to the drum the great skylight which carries out an eclipse as it shuts out the light for me it feels like a roman senate because it's used for weddings so they can put tables in front of the benches but it gives you know you can feel i can feel anyway the sort of sense that there might be togas you know <laughs> great sense of space it's also really monumental it, i believe it's still the tall, tallest round uh, structure in the uk next at every level there's natural light and views outside i was going to say something about this the structure but in the construction i'm going to leave it to you Pat. <laughs> But that flat roof worries me. And it is the problem of using natural materials with a modern aesthetic. My, my college by, by uh, Andy McMillan and uh, um, Izzy Metzstein, uh, Robinson has a, a, an artificial ground and it leaks to smithereens. We have a 10 year rebuild program, 1 million every year for 10 years. And the Keys Hostel, which was built while David and I were students on, uh, gosh, West Road, Harvey Court, also had the same problem. They had to rebuild it entirely. There's a real problem with pretending you're on the ground when you're not. Um, but I'll leave it at that. Next. <clears throat> After the recent show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Peter Eisenman opined the following, quote, deconstruction killed postmodernism. So what? I mean, it is utterly irrelevant for today. You know, we have much more serious problems, which David was aware of, you know, 30 years ago. One of the architects, second quote, one of the architects at Poundbury, you know Poundbury, called Ben Pentreath says, quote, we are engaged in creating a convincing fake. All architecture is essentially wallpaper. Underneath, it's all the same stuff. I think that David Lee's architecture puts the lie to that. The climate crisis needs his thinking. Above all, how we make underlies what we make. David, for me, was a master of light. This old photo of the library reading room at Sarancester has luminous walls washed with high level perimeter light. It always inspired a hush. RAC Royal Agricultural students were an entitled lot. 
they once kicked down a wall which Chris Bailey had made one vacation. They just kicked it down. Nevertheless, this room just asks for respect, as does the great, the dignity of the great John at Nacanthus. In the end, I think we have really, we've got to save the planet and make great architecture. Thank you very much. So how do I um, move it on? Let's try it now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all very much for inviting me um, to the seminar in memory of David Lee. This, um, I'm doing this one, aren't I? This slide um, is of the Uomo Universale, you're probably all familiar with. And architects are considered universally rounded people. Um, bridging the arts and the sciences. I think David was indeed one of the people most worthy of this description, and I'll try and explain why. Um, uh, I think, um, why I think this is. In some of the uh, issues about architecture, which I've been thinking about since working with him, um, and I'd like to share them with you. So you've seen this, the slide of this scheme before uh, John has shown us, it's Merton. And it, I had been aware of um, some of David's work before I met him. And I'll show you two rather contrasting ones. There's this one, which seemed kind of um, bedded in, I don't know, academic research really, F very much based on um, land use and built form studies work in Cambridge, looking at densities and form. And they actually built this scheme, this housing scheme in London, Borough of Merton. Um, in contrast, th this one is something that I just thought was so wonderful. Don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a studio for Jane, a friend of David's. She was an artist and it was in Somerset. And it, it's just so remarkable because um, I, I think it's the most direct way of making shelter, really. C can you see that they are, um, well, they're, they're trimmings from saplings and they're just stuck into the ground. Well, they were loaded first, cut and put on, on the top of the, David's car and driven to the site. And then David said it was just, they were tied together with miles of baling twine. So it, it, that formed the structure onto which bundles of thatch were tied. And um, it seems such a direct way of making really a very beautiful romantic space, which still stands. I think um, the idea was that it would just last for 15 years or something, but it, it's still, still there. And um, <clears throat> well, this is a bit like the, the picture you've just seen from John, this is phase one pleasant, of Royal Agricultural College in Sirencester. And this is phase two, which is for Code Court. And this is um, how I got to know David really, because he was looking for someone to run phase two on site. And actually this is something that I'd always thought I'd never do, work on a project on site that I had not been involved in designing, you know, knew nothing about the, the ideas behind it all the constructional details but somehow I, it seemed like a really interesting project and you know good chance to work with David so I I did um I decided I'd do it but maybe I met him in a um piano recital in Plus Brondanu Gardens 
which is um, the Clough Williams Ellis House in North Wales. And it's just sort of in that valley where Ogaronwy is. Um, and David came over and said hello. And um, that was the beginning of what became a very nice friendship. And for me, a really great chance to work in a very different way. Um, phase one and phase two of RAC are quite similar in a way because they share the same kind of architectural language. And um, when one thinks about what that aesthetic is, it's, I think one shouldn't think of it as um, looking backwards to some old style. It actually was quite very modern, but based on new, using materials, old materials, natural materials. Um, This, this interior is just to show you the thought that went into each room, each study bedroom. And there were um, ideas from um, arts and crafts interiors, which David really admired very much. You know, things like um, the window seats, the light coming in, the picture rail, which unified the curtain rails. Somehow everything was really very carefully thought out. And, um, I think that these were some things you'll see in many of the other projects if you look in detail at, at David's work. Um, unfortunately, when you look at the RAC website now, you see that the furnishings have changed. I mean, partly because several of the rooms now don't house one person, but two. And the curtains have been, you know, selected by somebody else and the furniture has all changed. So that is really an issue. Um, that we all have to be aware of, you know, when we build buildings for clients and they're not ourselves, because things are going to move on. Um, this slide just reminds me to talk in some detail about some of the materials. First of all, there were the roof tiles, which um, John has mentioned, and they were actually fantastic things because they were quarried out of the ground and um, they, they were called by the quarry men God's gifts because they really were like you just got this thing out of the ground then you could put them onto the roof and they did create this fantastic texture very beautiful um, and it's a very lovely concept that it was so local that you know if you imagine the embodied energy moving them to the site it's, it's very low but there are some downsides. Um, the, their unevenness, which is so attractive, allows wind-blown snow to be blown up beneath them. Um, and there's actually the problem of a procurement period because they have to be quarried. So they had to actually start um, quarrying them before the contract could really get going and then stockpile them. And this actually led to something which was totally unexpected which was fraud, because somehow or other, at some point, the people who were quarrying it um, pretended that they'd quarried more, and they just shifted the, the ones that had already been counted and measured around the compound and said, there they are, you know. So there, there were, um, that was a problem, which really shook us all very badly um, and did not, please the client obviously because at, we ended up trying to roof things with insufficient number of tiles because they haven't been quarried out in time plus some valuations had been done thankfully not by the architect but um which had paid the quarriers for tiles that didn't actually exist um the render was rough cast which were, and it was very limey um, but not so much done these days. So it's very beautiful, lovely texture. You can see how the light plays on it, you know, compared to, say, Pebble Dash. Um, and the plaster was really exciting, the plaster on the job, because he, he said, oh, yeah, I've heard about that, but I've never done it. So there was this huge learning process, um, which where he had to try doing things, and then the site visit, and we'd say, no, that's not quite right. Probably you had the mix a bit too wet. 
you know, and that, that's actually something that happens with this kind of hands-on work. The colour also was a bit of an issue because we specified sand from the quarry, which was used for phase one. And when they did the samples, the phase two render didn't look quite right. And it won't be checked. It was from the same quarry, but it was a different seam. So, you know, had to hunt around to find the right, absolutely the right sand to get the right colour. And the, the timber, both these external windows and the um, oak staircases were, were oak and they were not finished. So that there was a sort of slight worry, how would they look as they weathered? Um, in fact, the, they've done fine, but there's a funny story about this because um, when we went to do the def end of the defects inspection, remember David and I were in a pizza place or something, and I recognized one of the women who was also there and we said hello. And it turned out she was the cleaner and she cleaned these new, new houses with students. And I said, oh, how, how do you find it? She said, oh, it's really beautiful. They're lovely houses, they're really nice, but the staircases. So I said, oh yeah, what's wrong with the staircases? And she said, you know, I polish and polish them, but they never have a good shine. <laughs> so, so I sort of said, ah, oh, well, no, they're not, they're supposed to look old and weathered. And um, that's just how they're looking, you know, they're looking just like they should. And you know, the interesting thing was, she was really happy. She said, oh, now you've explained that, that's fine. <laughs> but um, you, you don't really know um, what she thinks, you, you know, at the end of it. Um, who thinks what, whether the students liked it or whether they, all their dirty mess was hard to clean up or what, you know, I don't know. And the thermal insulation was cellulose fiber. Um, and in the first summer, just before completion it was, there was a plague of flies everywhere. I mean, really, there were a lot of them, you know, they, they died on the windowsills or you saw them, you could practically sweep them up. And the domestic bursa, was convinced it was to do with this insulation. And he kept saying, why couldn't you use rock wool? You know, why did you use cellulose fiber? I bet these flies are breeding in there. So we had to actually open up the section. And actually there were no flies in there because the borax had done its job. And, you know, I think it was, I mean, all that blew away as it were, went away and wasn't, wasn't an issue. So probably, I don't know, it was from um, the animals that were outside or something, you know, no, nothing to do with the, the buildup of, um, of, the, of the houses. But I suppose the kind of moral is, um, if you do anything new and different, however much you research it, there will be doubting Thomases. And, you, you know, that's the sort of thing to, be terribly aware of so you, whether you whether you've got the guts ready to to try it and stick it out or you might think well I don't want to risk it because I don't want to you know it's my client's money it, I mean there really there's a dilemma there um David drew beautifully and he was very particular about technical drawings but he also loved doing these sort of perspective drawings with such um care and they were a way of working out for him um, how the buildings would sit in their landscape, which was something very key for him. So he did these lovely drawings, really poetic, but sometimes clients just don't know how to appreciate this. And at one stage, the college commissioned an artist's rendering it was some sort of um, perspective painting for fundraising and they hadn't consulted David. And actually the painting was pretty ghastly. <laughs> it was really horrible, but David was furious and he let it be known immediately to the client. Um, anyway, the client withdrew, the, withdrew that, that painting. I don't, I don't think it was used, but um, this does make us think about relations with clients. I mean, this is, these are sort of general questions that raised in my mind from experience and they, I don't think they relate just to David you know they're, they're kind of questions for all of us really 
Um, in the case of Siren System, that, that was an institutional client, which is even more complicated because there's so many layers, you know. In this case, there was the bursar who was a personal friend and did appreciate because he'd worked with David and commissioned previous buildings. So he did appreciate what David was trying to do. Then there was the, the domestic bursa. And actually since then, I've had lots of contacts with domestic bursas who can be quite, mm, I was gonna say problematic, but in the sense that they are responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the building. And they're going to try and go for a building that's terribly easy to clean and, you know, not, not have huge maintenance costs and all that sort of thing. And then there are the staff, you know, like the, that cleaner who was worried about the staircase. Um, and they're the users, these students who, I, I can remember that people say, oh, you know, these, these um, agricultural students, this was a client, the bursas, the domestic bursa saying it. They are, um, they're very rough. You know, they just don't, they'll just destroy all these things. They did everything, everything that was beautifully thought about and going to be made beautifully. The feeling was these kids are just going to trash it all. And David was very um, staunch and saying, you know, if you give people something nice, then they're going to treat it with respect. And, you know, by and large, I think that's absolutely true, that you can give them trash and they'll trash it. And then you'll just have to give them more trash. You know, so you sort of have to decide which way you want to go on that. Um, but it is a sort of nightmare network to negotiate. In, in relationship with the design teams, um, I had the sense that David got on really well with the structural engineers. And I've been thinking about this, you know, because actually there were quite a lot of difficulties with the mech and elect people. And perhaps that is because there's been a much longer tradition of structural engineers and architects working together on construction. Um, and actually electrical engineers and mechanical engineers and public health people are, have more recently come to the fore. And to the extent that now actually their, their components of building, in large buildings, they can make up you know, more than 50% of the capital cost. And they have um, much more input during the life of the building and running costs. So it could be that now, you know, times have changed a bit and we've, the, that relationship with the different engineers is also going to improve. I don't know, I, I hope. Um, and in terms of relationship with builders and suppliers, I think David had some really good relationships with some of the builders. As particularly the small builders, you know, who could um, talk together and work together on quite hands-on basis. But I, I really don't think he had much time for contract bureaucracy. Um, I sort of found that really tiresome. But then, you know, he did he did realize that it was important to sort of try and get people who could do take over some of that that work um i don't mean as a separate practice as, as john was saying but actually working with people who might have that sort of input um hmm. he he read very widely and very open-mindedly actually he was a philosopher as much as an architect um he was a great admirer of william morris of course but he studied the buildings and thoughts of more modern architects, such as Korb, Alto, Louis Kahn. And he um, studied buildings so carefully and deeply. It was very impressive to talk with him about buildings and really um, walk through them and investigate the sort of spaces that were um, put together. Uh, he carried his rigorous thinking into his research into energy. He read complicated papers by people like Bjorn Borg. I don't mean the tennis player, but there was this Bjorn Borg, I don't know if you've come across him, who um, 
wrote about things like dynamic insulation. Really interesting stuff. And I always thought it was really impressive how he continued to take things back to first principles. Really, I mean, that's something I keep thinking. David was no slouch. He really, really, you know, worked and thought hard. Um, but I've put up these slides because he, he was really keen on Katsura Palace in Kyoto. And I remember him showing me this. Um, actually, just as he introduced me to Diabelli variations, Beethoven's, I think he, he was listening to something on the radio once and he said, oh, do you know this? I said, no. And he said, oh, that's the most beautiful piece of music. And it was being played by, I think, your neighbor once, Fiona. She was Mitsuko Ushida. I think, anyway, he, he sort of came across her in this record shop. And then she was on the radio playing this, well, wonderful variations. And in a similar way, he was, you know, he told me about Katsura Palace, which I didn't know anything about. And I looked and thought, hmm, that's interesting. See the panels. I thought, okay, this is quite like Walter Siegel. That's what sprang to mind. And I could sort of see that his the development of the Siegel method into his um, timber frame, David's timber frame things, actually took a lot from these buildings. But really, it was when I, um, years later, went to Japan and saw this um, palace and its gardens, but I, I found, I understood how wonderful they really were. You know, I mean, it was the buildings and in their setting and so on and how, how people use them. So I'm very, extremely grateful to David for that. And um, he, um, oh yeah, they have very good vegetable gardens there too. Now, David loved nature and he chose to live in a beautiful valley in North Wales. Not quite this valley, because those who know will know this is Trevon, you know, <laughs> that's sort of like, but very nearby. Um, although he, I think that it meant he was very far from the centre. And this affected the kind of work he could get um, and the sorts of projects he got to work on. However, he, he had other opportunities and he could really engage in a number of experiments and trials. I mean, it, in um, he built, this is one of the things he built, which was the studio, which was like a, I was gonna say extension to the house, but it is sort of just kind of joined to the original house. And it's lovely, you know, you can see the drawings um, that he made of the, the setting. And some was, were imaginary of this kind of cliff-like place dropping away. And here's, here's David inside. And this actually, it wasn't ter terribly um, well insulated thermally. Actually, you see these, these um, sliding doors, this sort of typical Japanese thing. So in the winter, it got really cold, but there were these, do you remember Irene? There were these shutters, which were made of expanded polystyrene, which was sort of stacked up to the side and we had to put them into the, in front of the glass if, if we were cold. So there, there were ways of dealing with it, but it, I think it was such a marvelous place. I mean, it was a small office. Um, I think typically there'd be sort of four or five people there. Um, and this is, I think this might be the, the wood stack that John was referring to, but this is a picture um, with the wood stack. And there's David and then Ejin, who was a year out student, was from Singapore and Noel, who is an artist, a painter, and she worked as the administrator for part of the week. And you know, this was one of the experiments of cutting, cutting the timber, getting the timber, having it cut, having it brought, restacking it. This photo was taken by Emlyn Cullen, who actually did part his part one here at, in this school. And um, he said, "God, that that took days." And the guy, you know, had to work with loading up and unloading. He did, he did moan and groan. But there were lots of projects that came out of this. Um, and really, he was keen on horticulture. This is a cheat. This is not his thing. This is my allotment. But um, his, David had a thing about the land. And a lot of his thinking was about how people live in the land. Um, 
so that the timber growing was sort of part of the use of land. And he did grow stands of willow and things that he could cut for fuel. And you know, now recently I've been thinking how in, this is really interesting because I think that his, those original things partly sprang from the first um, energy crisis. Do you remember in the 70s? Well, maybe some of you are too young to know about that. But um, a lot of this work, I had the feeling, really emanated from that period. Um, and now here we are again. We could be thinking about all those things and trying to push it forward. Um, he did also look at insulation um, of the house. And I can remember how he did an experiment or tried, because it was all very new stuff of um, cellulose fiber, you know, when it's sprayed on the wet, with a wet thing, the hose, and you spray it against the wall with vertical studs. And um, it, and we, we did all watch this. I think the, these guys came for about a day and we did think what's going to happen with these dry stone walls, the damp, um, Will it come through? How will this, will, will the cellulose fibers take up the moisture or what? But actually it, it was pretty effective. I mean, he did work on other things that dealt with getting the moisture away from the outside before it came in, you know. But this was a great thing about how, how many of us had a chance to try out all these things um, on, I mean, quite often you have to try out on your own place because <laughs> you can't subject your client to it. But, um, you know, it was really great that he did all this because he also had um, an experiment with water powered generation from the stream nearby. So there were lots and lots of things that he did. Oh, yeah. And he did, had this. Um, have you heard of this guy, Foucault? Who, David was very key on this One Straw Revolution book. And it's really interesting, too. This, this chap, he, he was an agriculturist in Japan. And then he actually decided, what if we don't? do all the things we've been doing, but just let nature take its course. And uh, he, he did actually um, manage to kill quite a few citrus trees, I think, in the process of, you know, his father gave him an orchard and he thought, okay, I'll just leave it to, to grow itself. But, um, but I mean, again, that's sort of interesting thing of how, how much one has to tend or not. And the, I think now it's really become very common. You know, we all know about no dig gardening, no dig growing a veg, and sort of more importantly, um, letting the earth regenerate itself. So these things are becoming quite um, well known now. But, you know, there was David in the 80s and 90s really already thinking about all this and, and putting it in practice. Um, he enjoyed lots of things. He enjoyed, you know, walking in the hills, in the mountains, in all kinds of weather. And he did enjoy food and was happy to experiment. And we, share, we used to share lunches when the weather was good enough to sit outside. We'd sit in front of the house and we'd all have our, our sandwiches or whatever. And I do. I always remember this thing of David coming very proudly with this bunch of lettuce that he picked, you know, from his his veg patch. He and I used to somewhat be a bit competitive about our vegetables. And anyway, he said, "Anyone like to share?" And I looked at it, and there was this huge slug on this lettuce leaf, and I thought, "Ooh," because I I don't like slugs much. And he just sort of brushed it off and said, "Oh yeah, poor thing." <laughs> and you, you know that I, I thought, okay, David's really very close to nature. So. Um, but anyway, the, I, we didn't used to work late much. Um, there weren't these all-nighters as there are in some offices, and which I think turn a lot of people off practicing architecture, especially women. But so I was quite struck that although, you know, like I said, David would no slouch, and we used to do tons of drawings of all sorts. You just think, do we have to draw this again with the window moved just a fraction over? But, you know, we do all this, this stuff, not with CAD either, all by hand. But one, one day he did say, oh, I think we'll have to work a bit late. So maybe we'd like to stay for supper. So um, I said, oh yeah, what should we make? And we sort of dug around in the, the pantry 
And I said, oh, we can make a curry, can't we? We could do, and we did. We just made this sort of off, off the cuff thing meal and had it together and had a nice time. And we then went back and worked. And we didn't have to work all night. You know, it was, I just thought it was so impressive. After that, I thought, yeah, we don't have to work all night. You know, we just have to organize ourselves in some way and be rather self-disciplined earlier on. And maybe that was, that's the way to do it. Um, there are lots of issues still for which there are no easy answers and which it would have been interesting and instructive to debate with David. Even things like, what do we do about single-use plastics? You know, because that, that seemed kind of easy at one point and then COVID hit and then there was all this plastic. I have to say he was not always easy to be with, even though invariably he was thoughtful and courteous, but he was not a saintly type, thank goodness, really. <laughs> Would be, but um, he was honest and he was honourable and ethical, in a way that you know, what we've seen in the last recent past in British politics, you just wonder, wonder about. And he was good fun too. So you know, I do miss him. Um, and I just want to say, add one last thing, which was from this exhibition, I've had had a chance to look around. I was interested how. Often these ideas, these ideas that David had talked about and lived are expressed among all these um, different practices. The, the importance of people, places, aiming to be socially and environmentally sustainable, collaboration and research. I mean, I think these, these are things that are uh, aspirations. Not lot of people have these days. And so I think, um, you know, David's way of thinking was very influential. Uh, he was quiet, so he was inf influential in a quiet way. He was a great architect and teacher. And above all, he was a terrific human being. So thank you very much. Uh Uh, while we're swapping over, you all need to stand up. Because one thing I've learned, haven't you, Gwen? Two weeks can't sit in one hour with Gabriel, and both of your brain back to your arms. <laughs> so you do stand up and check around the next half hour. Thank you. The other thing would be good if you dim the lights. David would have hated this lighting. So, children, it's, it's, it's agricultural, so what we would say. I don't know if you can dim them, but they're pretty. Ah, you see how much nicer that is. Uh, we can see the slime. And we might need to just move that little, little thing over. And I'm just going to move us out the way because I hate that. Right. Um, yeah, I've got a microphone because I've got a very quiet voice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it in there. Do you want to see? Okay, is that working? Yeah, great. Thank you. You got a picker or should work? Yeah, yeah. okay. Thank you. Right, you may sit down. <laughs> I've got some notes. I, bet I can now not read because I've turned the lights off. Brilliant. <laughs> Heisted by my own, etc. Right, uh, thank you very much, John and Ben, because you've done part of the work for me. Because you can imagine, I've got to get through 30 years of work and friendship in 20 minutes, which is not easy. Um, it says here. Yeah, and um, you can see there's, there's quite a lot on this screen already. Um, one thing I've got to say as an advert, because this book, brilliant book by Adam, who's also helped me do this, because most of you, I hope, have read it. Those who haven't, the family have found another 50 copies which are for sale, so do buy it, because it's the most fantastic interview, really, with David that Adam's put together. So there's my advert. Um, right, and you can see that our work, uh, it, was, it was pretty convivial, I have to say. Uh, you can see we went with Sheila and, and near Connect, probably. Um, lots of walking. You can see from this painting over here, which is done by one of our a Mark student who's actually never been to CAT. He's doing it all online from Spain, but he's done this 
fantastic painting of David in his lovely boat in which he tried to drown me several times in the Irish Sea because it wasn't really made for that sort of thing. Anyway. So um, what was it like to work with him? Um, he was pretty average, I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, an average principled stubborn genius is how I put it. They're all like that. Uh, and you just have to live with it. As I say, we had a pretty convivial relationship. We never actually argued uh, because basically I'd just say, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so we, yeah, we, uh, it was a, I can go on. It was a, Charles Warlow raised his hand. Well, put it down. Um, this what the top is missing because of the zoom thing. Let me get rid of it. Can we get rid of that? Uh, 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 don't know more. Get rid of uh, no. Oh, well, above that it says <laughs> our collaborations. Um, because it was a collaboration, we weren't partners, we both had our own practices which in a way was dead inefficient because we had two lots of PI, two photocopies, but actually was really cheap. I mean, very low cost way of doing work um, with a fax machine at one hand and the phone and so on. Uh, we worked very well. Uh, and we basically each took on their job. The ones in yellow are ones that have completed. There's one missing off the bottom, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, and basically it was uh, whoever got the job, it was their job, they were the principal architect and we employed the other person's consultant. So it went very well. So some of those that are coming off the screen in the bottom are ones we had a bit to do with each other. It wasn't always we were working together. We weren't very monogamous. We were quite happy to work with other people. We didn't get jealous. Um, well, you weren't monogamous. Um, so uh, yeah, so the yellow ones, and you notice that most of them are at CAT because they were a fantastic client um, who were pretty in tune with what David wanted, what we wanted. Oh gosh, well, I can't read any of that. Right. Um, I'll just crack on. So, oh, why is it not working now? Should work, shouldn't it? Maybe it's run out of batteries. No, that works. Uh, okay, it's working now. Well, Right, so, ah, oh God, and you can't see the top. I'm gonna move this down the bottom. Right, let's move that. Uh, down there, right there, look. Um, so we first worked together on this thing called gear change, where Cat was trying to change gear to a higher speed. And this is my finest project, sewage system. <laughs> I'm totally pleased with that. That worked beautifully. And, it's, you know, it's, uh, sewage is great. Um, <laughs> So, but however, we also, okay, okay, I'll go to enter, no, click, that's weird, isn't it? Mm. Okay, um, but we also want to do this cliff railway, water balance cliff railway, and I suggested we got in touch with David to help design or to come with me to design the railway stations. Why? Because um, as John has alluded to, um, he was a, a admirer of and friend of, as I was Walter Siegel, here he is. Um, and this is one of David's slides because David did lots of lectures and so on. Um, and he says down there, if we could read it, uh, yeah, that what's good about the Siegel method. And also, as John has uh, told us all about uh, Walter's, this is uh, home, home and Environment 1947, uh, showing that you could do high density housing uh, at low, uh, low rise high density housing using courtyards and hence the Fredensburg and all that. And we were both, we had both and were both doing schemes like this. So we got together at the time we at CAT were sort of developing Walter's scheme uh, in the way you'd expect, well insulated, benign materials and so on. And David was doing, as has been mentioned, a similar thing or several years earlier and, and just made it more beautiful. Simple as that, really. 
with, as John said, doors you could actually walk through because it was on a 900 grid. Walter's doors you had to walk sideways through because they're on a 600 grid. Um, and all that what would be, you can see there, just the, the care and attention and the detailing to make it a fantastic way of building and courtyards, of course. Um, so that was that scheme. So this is what we worked on, the railway stations. Um, David, I think it was Emlyn was working for him at the time, yes. They uh, were, took charge of the bottoms, the lower station and me at the top. Uh, the top was the women's building team because uh, all these projects are self-built by CAT because it's perfectly capable of running its own projects and employed people from all over the country who are interested in doing it. So the top was the women's building team under Cindy Harris. The bottom was the men's. Now guess who finished first? <laughs> and who did a better job? Okay, no, there's no contest. Anyway, so, but it was great because I was working with David and working out this method we were going to use. We were going to use homegrown oak, so on and so forth, breathing constructions. How was that going to be? And his huge... It was a polymath, really, huge knowledge of architecture and construction and energy. And he could even design electric lighting if needed to be, um, was fantastic. And that was a big change for me and for Kat, because Kat wasn't that interested in architecture. Uh, but here was a bit of quality coming into what up to then had been fairly random development of Kat. Um, let's say organic, be nice about it. Um, so we built these and uh, you can see that obviously the Japanese influence, it looks like that one of them temples, um, but we're all using these, this new way really of thinking about construction. So we asked the forester in Welshpool, Paris Estates, what would you like us to use in terms of oak? So he said, oh, well, I've got loads of thinnings so if they could be six inches square and six foot tall I've got tons of that so this is a different way of thinking about design in that you're deliberately limiting yourself to what is let's say environmentally the better thing to do uh, and uh, you can just read it at the bottom so this is another David slides which has been alluded to but that really summed up what he and we were trying to do and bring nature, climate, harmless materials, clear construction and proportion. Um, and then you had uh, his knowledge of uh, vernacular buildings and the whole of architectural history going right back. So the railway station is a three bay classic plan, which works incredibly well because you've got a railway in the middle and passengers either side. And that we went to see tithe barns on our way to visit various jobs. Uh, and there you got the same thing as the cathedral, three bay, you know, so it's a, it resonates with, uh, I suppose it's pattern language type stuff. It resonates with years of how we like to build really. Right. Uh, this is sort of post rationalizing what we came up with um, in that in historic buildings, it's all uh, abundant min mineral and renewable because that's all I had. So it's, it's, uh, extremely sustainable, people power, animals, and so on. Then when the Victorians came along, we started to use industrial materials. Um, and it was a reasonable thing to do, really, to use bricks, which use a lot of energy, iron, glass, to get better buildings. Trouble is now, it's 80% is of those highly uh, unsustainable, should we call them, materials uh, with perhaps 20% of wallpaper, a green wallpaper. So here's an example, ooh, not too far from here, um, of a steel frame building, crazily clad with slate on the front. Not, you know, slate is really strong, makes great walls. To anyway, um, so what we tried to do, let's move that anyway, is, um, how can you get rid of it? Anybody know? Gwyn, how do you get rid of that? Um, yeah, good idea. Um, uh, yeah, it's to reverse that because buildings, you know, what we were trying to do is keep the rain out, which we mostly manage. Um, 
keep warm, make it solid enough to put up shelves and you know make great architecture with, but it's really undemanding as a material. You can use very basic materials, reverse that trend and use 80%, shall we say, pre-modern materials. And Peter Harper, who was uh, Katz, uh, philosopher, uh, yeah, called it industrial vitamin. So you need something we've obviously developed. So we've got cables and pipes and electronics and things, but you only need it for that which makes life comfortable, which is the whole point. And he's called it meta industrial. And meta is a really handy word nowadays. Isn't it weird? Why isn't it doing it? Ah, there we are. But this is David's favorite word, fakery, he would shout. <laughs> and I'm afraid if you look around modern and look at any magazine, that's what you see. Because I think as John said, or somebody said, uh, you know, architects just do the front skin and the back skin and what happens in the middle, that's somebody else's job. Um, so that's to do with this thing of kind of trying to be honest with materials. It's a difficult word because we all, you know, fake things a little bit, but um, he couldn't stand, and quite rightly, something that wasn't what it seemed to be, I suppose. Yeah. Right, on to the next one, which is the autonomous blah, blah, blah. Um, attic, it's called. It was the Shop and Information Centre. And, yep, yeah, there we are. So it's full of all the sort of stuff you expect from CAT. It was a genuine attempt. Uh, to do a zero carbon building in 2000. Um, I, you know, difficult thing to define, but what we thought to be sustainable, you have to collect as much energy as you use, preferably more, sell it to somebody else, because then it will, in a way, pay for the embodied carbon that goes in to build the building. So that the, my calculation was 40 years, we would have, uh, done that and therefore it's truly zero carbon which is a difficult thing to achieve I mean this is as green as you get and it's 40 years so yeah so it had all the sorts of things and uh, um, trying to do no PVC no cement so quite radical in this way but it did it uh, and it's a lovely thing um, and again it's a three bay actually post the beam frame because that's what we're we find it very difficult or did find it very difficult design without doing a post and beam frame because we we kind of got used to the fact of having corner windows and things which you can really only do that sort of construction unless you're going to put loads of steel and concrete in so but in this case the posts post and beam the posts were made of earth which is quite unusual uh, and because we needed to uh, build the posts and the walls, so this is very Barcelona pavilion, some columns and some walls as a way of holding the thing up, we had to build the roof first because it rains a lot in Mahuncliffe, you may know. Um, and we wanted to build these walls in the dry. So that meant the ridges had to be above them so you could get above and ram it. Um, so that gave way to this sort of form whereby we've got trusses, but they're supported uh, in the middle of them, which is kind of odd and a bit like the fourth road bridge, which is exactly how that works. There's Sir Benjamin Baker um, being a railway train going across the fourth bridge. Anyway, so yeah, and so that's what we did. So that's how we could build these round earth walls inside out of the rain. This is uh, James Todd, who now runs Archetype in London. So he's getting his good training in ramming earth. <laughs> um, right, so there it is, rammed earth, fantastic material. I mean, it's beautiful. There's a lot of rammed earth being done now. You have to just watch it a bit because a lot of it is earth concrete, not rammed earth. This is just the earth, the clay being the binder. And it was made into a shop. Now, much to David and my delight, <laughs> the shop was no longer um, viable. So we could strip it out and go back to the lovely building it was before the shop moved in. It's, you know, that architect's thing, they're great without the people. <laughs> um, 
So here it is, and our lovely fourth year students, um, Freya and Simon and so on, built this great furniture in it. So we can now have it as an exhibition space, which you see, and it shows it in all its glory of ash floors, clay plasters, round earth, lots of daylight, um, all homegrown timber, larch, not, not great in some areas, but uh, pretty good. Uh, and well, this was David's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was good that, but rather sad, of course, that we were able to hold David's celebration of his life in April in this building, which was rather good. Yeah. Uh, mm, come on. It's because I moved it. What? It's, it's because you moved it. it. Uh, what do we do then? How do we go on? We should start again. Just start again. Got, got it. It's much better picture here. Um, ah, there we are. Okay, meanwhile, we did lots of other jobs. You saw all those grayed out ones. So there was a lot of work that didn't get built. Some did get built, but not by us. Uh, so we didn't count them. Um, you know, they got picked up by somebody else. It wasn't all black and white, built, not built. Um, so these are some of them. This was a... a would have been a great community centre up in Sledburn, Lancashire. Courtyard housing, of course, this is in Cornwall. Another one in Dorset, I think, can't remember. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna show you briefly a bit what it was like. We've seen some of David's sketches and little drawings. So this was for Norbury Village Hall, which we were working on. And this is what I would get. I've been doing a bit of doodling. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, coming up with two schemes, which were, oddly we presented the class and they liked the modernist one and the villages hated it. So we went back to that one. But anyway, so you can see we got, I got <laughs> just this. Oh, lots and lots and lots of drawings, all the different, what could we do? You know, I mean, you know, these were minutes apart. He'd come back with, oh, maybe it's better we do that. It's absolutely exhausting. And, um, you know, light, of course, modernism, light. David was obsessed with how the light falls down walls and so on. Um, and the sort of, he loved the Utsun Mallorca house with those splayed things. So you see that appearing again and again. Um, some, you know, quite sh harsh. That's actually one of my drawings, I've realised. It's nowhere near as good. Anyway, um, yeah, so it went on. So that was kind of what it's like. I mean, brilliant, really, but exhausting. And we spent most of our fees at that stage. So we had to be pretty efficient at the working drawing stages, which fortunately we were. So David did teach uh, at CAT. And there's John, look. Um, this is Gwyn's year. 2017-ish, 16, so fifth, okay. Um, because this was after Wise was finished, uh, but in 2000, CAT realized, it says under there, that we had these MSC uh, programs and we're potentially thinking about a master's in architecture. So we needed a building and that was our brief, which was a brief brief, wonderful. You know, that's all you need, isn't it? Uh, we scribbled on it, yeah, maybe 20 people, a site hut size laboratory. Dave is written on the bottom, it says under there, empty room. So there is still, it's nearly empty, the cloakroom as you come in. That was the empty room because you don't know what's going to happen and it's bound to change. So why not leave a room empty and it'll find its purpose. So that was that. And then we did what we always do, which is, um, it's called planning for real. Uh, on most schemes, we did this. That is working with the client. Here's some of the client body um, to design the building and doing these sorts of exercises, what people really, really want for their brief. Very good techniques and ending up with making little models really of what it was going to be. And it was a partner and contract and so on. This is the first building cat didn't self build, big mistake. Anyway. Um, so we ended up with a couple of different schemes that David sketched them out, you know, because it was all pretty obvious in a way is the existing restaurant and kitchen. Well, we come off that, maybe there's an atrium, don't know. Anyway, 
And then, of course, the ideas started flowing. Um, so this was celebrating the reign of Mahuncliffe and some spatial things, courtyards, of course, inward looking, outward looking courtyards, the architectural route through the building, discovering new spaces as you go up there, which is what I think makes it an amazing building, is that continuous change from looking at one inside space to a, a distant view and so on. And then perhaps we'd, we'd been persuaded by Kat to do a circular lecture theatre, because they'd been to one in Denmark and thought it was nice, crazy for a lecture theatre, acoustics, terrible. Um, but we went with it and then David thought, oh, we use it as a hinge. So it's a hinge between the orthogonal part of the building relating to the restaurant and the other bit, which goes down the contours of the slate tip. So all that sort of thing. And then, of course, much thinking about the lecture theatre, which has been pointed out is a pretty magical space. We wondered if we could do it in massive round earth blocks because we'd seen Martin Rauch, the uh, German round earth genius, doing that, building huge ashlar blocks. And of course, David was dead keen on that. And he related it to the treasury of Atreus uh, in Mycenae because it was about the same size. So I thought, well, if they can do it, uh, and courtyards, of course, we were, I've always been fascinated with the long history of solar energy, L-shaped buildings, tight courtyards. And so, yeah, he did some of his wonderful perspectives. This was at a time when you could have ramps in a building of reasonable slope. Uh, it changed after we did this building race change. We couldn't do ramps anymore. It would have taken up the whole restaurant. But you can see the intention of way you go up and you're, you're attracted always like a fly to the light and you go on up to the courtyards or the terraces running along the hill. At the time, and I still want to do it, I don't know if Eileen's here, but um, we still want to do this, which is to put bedrooms in the woodland uh, by the North Drive, because it would have been absolutely fantastic, two lifts, this is a sort of um, common room on a slate base, good solid slate base. And um, this is very similar to one of the pictures that John showed, because uh, he hadn't got that many bright ideas. So it's always the same thing really, of a wonderful window seat, a corner seat up in the trees this time, which had made it special, and the built-in bed and all the usual, and the hatching, look, the hatching again, um, yeah. And we continued the palette that we developed before um, at Attic. And that this was so successful, Kat said, do it again. And Kat, you know, they said, please innovate. Well, you know, not many clients say that. Please innovate. We'll take, you know, take responsibility, do it. Okay. Um, so we went with this new, uh, there's Lime Creek, it doesn't sound there, but. Um, the usual sort of renewable stuff, but also uh, hempcrete or hemp lime, which was incredibly successful. And here it is. That's what it ended up with before you render it. So this was going back and John mentioned, or somebody mentioned the, uh, yeah, the code, the houses, where he liked the big concrete blocks, just one material. And some things you can do that in, straw bale, hemp lime, just one material rendered inside and out. So it's given a kind of neutral skin, keep it dry and so on. And we thought this was fabulous, 500 mil thick, back to that solid architecture. It's all cast around a huge Gulam frame. Those are the legs of the very clever um, Bureau Hapold engineer who are ridiculously young, these people. They're so clever. God, it's so annoying. Um, Bits of steel, these are industrial vitamins to, so that we could do what we wanted with the timber frame, glue lamp frame, tons and tons of wood, 20 kilometers of six by two. This is what's now called Brechtstapel. That is a solid, a solid, solid deck of timber. So rather than concrete, it's timber. And it's, all, you know, it's a, only 150 deep spanning six meters, really efficient. And there it is, lovely. Um, Photos by Tim Sower. 
So you can see all the sorts of things that John was talking about, the entrance, the sort of um, Frank Lloyd Wright come uh, Japanese entrance of courtyards. And there's only one way you can go here. You can bounce in. You've got to go in the entrance here. Uh, and then you go into up to the light and so on. Courtyards, uh, cloisters, well, partial, sort of semi-cloistered um, water for light to reflect off into the rooms, which works. It's fantastic. Um, leaky flat roofs, as was mentioned, uh, still leaking. So it's consistent, 12 years later, still leaking. Um, nobody seems to be able to do a rubber roof. Um, uh, we were going to do metal on that, but we couldn't afford it. So there's another roof up there. Solar collectors for hot water. The bedroom, single-sided. You know, most bedroom blocks have a horrible corridor down the middle. I call it the Holiday Inn plan. Uh, and one lot of bedrooms looks over the car park and the other looks over the other car park. But in this case, it's they're single-loaded. And as John was saying, open... Uh, uh, call, uh, what do you call it? Walkways open to the sky around the back. And a lot of this, you have to go outside to get from here, the foyer, into the workshop. You go outside, you're protected. And to get to your bedroom, you have to go outside. And we think that's a really good thing to do to remain connected. Most universities, this is a little university, you, I mean, this one's now got windows, but I've lectured in them, they're in the basement. You don't know what the hell's happening outside. Got no connection to nature. So very important that all rooms have a view and all of them connect to something outside. A courtyard, a distant view. This was mentioned of um, Aaron Gessile. Uh, and the lecture theatre circular, which is what they wanted, but it's got views out if you want to when you get bored. Uh, and there's the uh, Oculus. Um, yeah, so you've seen that picture. As I say, there's only so many students just put, and I'm sure architects just put doors in walls and expect people to walk in. You know, you've got to attract people in and there's no other way you could, you could go here, you're here, you're bounced in like a pinball machine, you'll go through the front door. So, you know, that sort of obvious design, shallow buildings, daylit from the back, um, connecting these all slide open, connecting to an outside room, to use the pattern language terms. Um, this was the sort of architecture you get with David. Um, all right, it's worth just making a short stop for two stories. So this is a round column and all but one column, Gwyn, yes, thank you, uh, that's standing free of the walls around because you walk around them good idea and so david said well they're around columns why shouldn't they have entrances like greek and roman and the lily hayden who made the blue lamb said yeah we can do that we've got to turn it down anyway we just turn it down a bit more so this i sent them a drawing of roman entrances which is parallel then tapers in and they did it for 180 pounds for all the columns so, you know, when David suggests these things and everybody goes, what, what's entities? Um, but it works, you can see it's more elegant and it's cheap, you know, uh, it's only timber. The other story is these stairs, which are wonderful. So David was very keen on a very relaxed way up to the next level, to the foyer level. And I pointed out, it doesn't actually comply with building regs because they give you minimums. So we had building control officer there and David brought in Vitruvius and opened it and said, look, what's changed since Roman times? And the building control officer, oh, I, I don't know, I'll go back and ask. So, <laughs> so he phoned back later that day and said, the stairs thing is more of a suggestion than a rule. <laughs> so you might like to know that building regs is more of a suggestion than a rule. So we did our extremely relaxed um, Carl, who's now the program leader, showed me yesterday or day or day, you could run up them, but not down them, because you can take two, two at a time going up, but you fall over if you don't go down. <laughs> anyway, yeah, and then up into the foyer and these pictures by uh, Peter, fantastic. And 
it, things you never realize are going to happen. That's the lovely thing about architecture is that it surprises you, even though you've been thinking about this for six years or something and done models and done computer models and little drawings. You don't realize how wonderful the shadows are of sunlight that you get in this building, because we do get sun in Huntleth. Um, but, you know, this trick of, uh, of David's favorite trick of uh, roof lights shining onto walls so you get the reflected light also has this incredible effect of bars of sunlight coming down them. And there's, as you've seen, the lecture theater with the Oculus and acoustic treatment because it's a silly shape. And um, this, you could, if you could move around, you'd see these are slatted just like that, but they're made of wood. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, uh, right. And so there they are, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, there they are, there. Look. And David insisted that it was gold with dark green on top. I don't know, he must have seen an Alto building with it or something. He was absolutely insistent on this. The students find it a little bit daunting because it's quite a, a yes, it's a, it's a sort of secular cathedral in a way, makes people very quiet. Um, but, you know, they love it. We love it. There's graduation. And we get very important people to come and lecture. And Peter, Patrick Hannay. Um, yeah. So it's pretty good. It's pretty successful. And the spaces are gorgeous. And the light you get from this. And this, of course, these are the rainwater spouts. So you get the water dripping long after it stopped raining off the turf roof. Uh, into this, which is pretty wonderful. These trees are now huge and I couldn't knock it over. Um, but this is just to say the best thing ever was that we had 10 years really of enjoying uh, being our own, they call it soft landings, you know, post occupancy evaluation, of being able to be within it and teach within it is a fantastic experience and getting to know the building that you've designed that was in. Our heads, um, yeah, it was terrific. Okay, just nearly finished. Uh, it's been mentioned about his love of, you know, monasteries and solid stone architecture. And David then realized that hemp lime, hempcrete, mixture of lime and hemp, could give him that sort of architecture. Uh, so he did this down here, somewhere down here, um, and hang Tristan on it for a few months to check that it would take the weight. Um, but uh, what he envisaged really was a sort of Hassan Fathy type of architecture of vaulted constructions. And there's the Utsun window again. <laughs> there it is. Uh, yeah, so thick walls because you've got to resist the thrust of the vault. Um, but you could do this wonderful uh, window in it. Uh, and I'm pleased to say we're continuing that because we also think it's a good idea because hemp lime is incredibly strong. It's used in a non load bearing way on Wise and everywhere else, but it pretty obviously can hold things up. So we we the students built this in May, and we're kind of testing it, and we'd like to continue the idea of this. We'd like to build this really. Yeah. Uh, okay, last bit. So the last scheme we worked on together was Tristan and Claire's house. You can't quite see that. Um, and uh, he did a design for it. Oh, and then another. Uh, ooh, uh, and uh, Claire tells me there are 23 different versions. Is that correct? Right, 23 different versions of basically the Star and Sister type house, really. Two-story here, single-story, making a courtyard. Tricky site because... To the south side, it's a bit ugly, isn't it? And to the north side, it's fabulous. So, um, and on it went, lots of little sketches and drawings and <laughs> sections, elevations. And of course you can't do, uh, oh, you can't see that, but you can't do a section. You can't work out the elevation until you know how you're gonna build it. And that was one of David's great strengths. And what we try and ram home to the students is what's it made of? Yeah, you can't just do, whoa, I want this. You've got to know how it's made. All right, not maybe in detail, but enough 
so that you know you can do those heights and it will look like that. Um, so you can never dissociate the two. And that's what David showed, and on it went, and on it went. Lots of little sketches. Eventually, we got it in for planning. Hooray! Yeah. So I tidied them up a bit, put them on the computer, and it went into planning, and you've got planning, haven't you? And you're going to crack on as soon as you can. Um, last time I saw David, he leant over and said, actually, Pat, I thought of a much better one. <laughs> it's single story, and it, I've got... Okay, thanks. Uh, so this was, uh, yes, this was, well, this isn't me, this is actually Andrew Bocco, because uh, he came, did this wonderful book called Vegetarian Architecture, and it's kind of what we're on about, very much actually, um, in that uh, the gear change I talked about was about speeding up, but working with David, it was also about changing down a gear into a more solid, you know, into first gear and grinding along. Um, and giving you something more worthwhile. And Andrea likens this sort of thinking to basically the slow food movement, whole foods, um, organic, real food. Uh, and that's why his book is called Vegetarian Architecture. You should get it, it's really good. Um, so he came up to lecture at CAT and then he came on to meet Dave. And you can see this was in April, I think, or yeah. Uh, you can see how, you know, absolutely absorbed he is by what Andre Bocco was saying. So I was going to read a thing. Right. I'm going to finish with a quote from David because it's great. He was a terrific writer. Uh, the basic syntax of all architectural languages is not the materials used, but the space relationships, the parts of the building to each other and to the external world where space flows free everywhere. We take a part of this freely flowing space and wrap walls around it and divide it up to the client's needs. How we contain these spaces and focus the experience of them, what materials and structure system we must fit, we must fit and be integral to the spatial organization. But that comes a little later. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> I think we've run over quite a bit. Uh, we've only got 15 more minutes, haven't we? Yeah, we're yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you each so much for those talks. They were really brilliant. Um, it's been wonderful to have your stories and your different accounts. All the talks have overlapped. It's been great to see the same building several times, yeah. but all have been so clearly distinct as well. It makes me really glad to have created the challenge of three short talks rather than a single memorial lecture. I think it's worked really well. Um, what you showed, I think, or each of you, is how architecture, which after all is a passion, and I think you showed that really well. It's a discipline, of course, it's a practice, and it unfolds over a lifetime, interweaves with all other aspects of life and all the key relationships that it holds with colleagues, with students, with friends, with family members. So you all highlighted different aspects of the same projects that relate not just to how you see them and to what you see as important about them, but to the relationships that you had with David and the ways that you worked with him on these projects or the ways that you uh, got to know these projects. So many of you here will have so many other perceptions and stories about him to share. I love that you all spoke, that you all also spoke about his legacy and some of the lessons that the youngest architects here, and I'm glad to see that there are still a few of you who've stayed the course, um, could learn everything um, from how to make a scarf joint on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic, to um, how to form good relationships to clients and builders, to how to avoid eating a slug on a lettuce leaf, um, and how to make beautiful analog drawings, which I think in these days, of uh, so many tools available to young architects is still so important. So thanks again to each of you so much and to you all, of course, for coming. <laughs>